and welcome to Jolene Knits A Lot. This is my show about knitting and crafting and the things I get up to here in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, where we have gotten the most snow in the last two weeks and we have all winter. <laughs> I'm a little jealous of everybody who's having spring and green flowers because um, we're definitely still under snow here, but the weather is turning and it's warming up, which is great. Last weekend, I um, went down to Calgary with my older daughter. She was performing and uh, the two of us went on a bit of a road trip. Um, the weather was kind of not so great. It was very snowy and the highway was not fabulous, but I did manage to sneak in a trip to Polka Dot Creek Yarns, which is a fabulous dyer in Airdrie, Alberta. Airdrie is just north of Calgary and oh they make the best yarns so of course I brought some yarn home and I thought I'd share that with you right now. As you may or may not know I'm super excited about the new uh, sock book by Summerlee Designs, the sock, the sock project and I have a couple of socks from that book off my needles to share with you in a little bit but I wanted to stock up on some yarns that would be good for a lot of the more textural or cable or lacy designs in the book that I think benefit from either very lightly speckled yarn or a more tonal yarn. So let me show you some of the yarns that I brought home. Um, and believe me when I say that there is a lot of yarn. The way that her store is divided is on one wall there is all of the fingering weight and she's got tons of tonals and she's got um, speckles lightly and more strongly speckled. She also has self-striping yarn and then she has sock kits. So that's all on one side. And then underneath the main skeins, you will find minis in almost all of the colors that the full skeins are in. The same is true on the other side where she has DK yarn and worsted weight. Her DK yarn does include, I, I'm not sure, I'm gonna say right here, how much nylon, so that it's great for socks. You can use her DK for socks or for sweaters or whatever you like, um, which is great. But she has um, a bit of a smaller selection in the heavier weights. She also has some fluffy yarn too, if you're interested. I'm gonna put a link to her shop in the show notes below if you're interested in visiting. Let me show you some of the yarns that I brought home. In an amazing turn of events, it happened to be their birthday weekend. And um, it was their third birthday that they were celebrating and everything was 20% off except for some special things. So I picked up their third anniversary sock yarn, this lovely speckled yarn with uh, a mini in frost. The mini is 20 grams, I believe. Yes, it's a 20 gram mini. Um, so that is lots of fun. And that will be a sock set, I'm sure, from the sock project. Uh, the next yarn, oh, I picked up this fun speckly one. It's called Neapolitan, just like the ice cream. And this one too, I think will be a lovely pair of socks from her book. I have to apologize. Blue is just outside my office door. If I let him in, he might bark a lot. Um, I guess we're gonna have to run the risk. He just likes to be around. If you hear him crunching on a sweet potato treat, that is the price we're gonna have to pay. So I got the Neapolitan and this one and the other uh, sock set that I showed you are 75% uh, superwash merino, 25% nylon. There is um, 463 yards in 100 grams. This one is really pretty. Uh, and then <clears throat> I also checked out her tweed fingering because I just want to try out some tweedy socks. So I got frost, which is the same color as that mini from the other set, it turns out. And this is her tweed fingering base. This is 85% superwash merino, 15% Donegal nips. And it is 438 yards in 100 grams. So I'm gonna be trying um, all, all of these sock yarns over the next little while as I work through the many patterns in the sock project, which I'm super excited about. Now, the other thing that I really wanted to get when I was there was some minis because I know that she does minis so very well. 
And um, so I let my daughter pick a bunch <laughs> um, of minis just to make heels, cuffs, and toes. So these are the colors that I got. We went with a very bright sort of aesthetic. And each of these is 20 grams, so it's got 92 yards. It is the 75% super, 75 superwash, 25% nylon base. And Shelly sells these, Shelly's the owner of the shore, store. She sells these individually like these. She also sells them in yarn bouquets. So you can get um, whole groupings in colors that um, are usually seasonal. Sometimes she does monthly um, kits. I know right now she's working on a month by month kit of nine colors to make a um, sort of patchwork blanket. So every month you get nine colors and that would make one square of the blanket. So she has all sorts of different clubs going on, but these are the minis that I picked. I have highlighter, um, neon pink, lime, limeade, bright aqua, and purple pop. And I'm not sure how these are going to be working. Oh, this this looks fun. Um, maybe this one needs. That's that aqua. That's a bit much. Maybe the pink. I'm not sure. I have so many. I do have some minis and odds and ends. But I just thought it'd be fun to pick up some some really bright stuff to mix in with the yarn that I already have. Now, as I said, it was their birthday weekend, and they were having a sale. But not only that. When I got to pay for my yarn, there was a little wheel, like Wheel of Fortune, and you could win a prize. So my daughter spun and I won a t-shirt. And this is what I picked. Knit. This is a really big long sleeve white t-shirt that says knit. And you, I'm sure you will be seeing me wearing this on the podcast. So needless to say, it was a fabulous trip to Polka Dot Creek. And in fact, it seems like most times that I've been to Polka Dot Creek, something special has been going on. I know I visited there on a local yarn store day one time and she was giving away prizes. Um, it's just a really, really lovely shop. If you ever get to be there in person, I totally recommend it. It's not very big, um, the shop part. Uh, she does have an excellent selection of all of her yarns and she does carry some embroidery supplies. She carries her yarn in many different weights and she also carries needles and other accessories. And in the back of her shop is where they do all the dyeing. So it's all done in one place. And if you're very nice, you might ask for a tour. One day I'm gonna be brave and I'm gonna ask for a tour when I have lots of time. So that was my trip to Polka Dot Creek again. It's a lovely, lovely store. She's beautiful yarns. And I think you can see by the different, even just the different sock set that I sock sets that I picked, um, how like varied her yarns can be. And I didn't even pick up any of her self-striping stuff. And she's just great self-striping yarns. Um, so I totally would recommend going if you're in the area. And if not, check out her online shop. She has tons of stuff going on there too. Now let's get to some finished objects. I was working on these last time and I'm not sure how much I had left to do, but this is the first set of socks that I'm making from the sock project. These socks are um, Summer's very basic socks and it's the socks uh, recipe that she likes and she uses. So I thought I'd start there um, just to get a feel for how she likes to knit her socks. So this is simple heel flap and gusset. It's got um, a two by one rib, which I actually quite like and then a plain sort of wedge toe. And that's uh, sock number one. I was using leftovers for these socks. I'll be honest, I wanted to use up um, little bits of yarn. It's sort of my hope with this project, my sock project, is to use up little bits of yarn that I have um, also. So sock, sock, pairs of socks number one, first pair of socks off the needles from the sock, um, the sock project. And then I started another pair of her basic socks. Um, my thinking is I'll work through some of the basic socks to get a feel from for some of the her ideas on socks um, or her approaches to socks. And then I'll get into some of the more fun and um, detailed socks. So this, I'm not doing all of the socks because um, some of the techniques uh, are just ones that I do a lot and hers and mine are quite similar. Um, so the ones that I'm not doing are the forethought 
or the short row heel because I do have a short row heel that I like. I'll stick with that one. And the her afterthought heel, which is basic. Having read her instructions, it, it is what I do. So I didn't bother to, I'm not going to bother to knit her version because it's exactly the same as what I do. What I did want to try though was her folded over um, cuff. So this pair of socks, and I do have two of them. Um, this is knit out of, this is some tuku fingering. Um, the toes, heels, and the inside of the cuff are made with some Exmoor socks uh, yarn that I just have lying around. And I wanted to try this technique, this folded over hem. And the first time I did it, uh, if you're not familiar with the technique, you cast on and then you knit a certain number of rows. And then in this case, I changed color. So you can see here, I started with this yellow, I cast on and I knit a certain number of rows. Then I switched to the main color and I knit the same number of rows. And then I knit a row where I knit the two of them together. Let me just show you the inside of my sock because I feel like I did a pretty good job of it. Um, now, the first time I did this, it, it full disclosure, I had to do it more than once. Because the first time I did it, the way I was picking up from the cast on edge, it was giving me a very um, big um, sort of, but not bulge, but like I, it, I wasn't picking up right at the edge, I think is what was happening. So I was getting quite a bit of fabric right here and it was too, I didn't like the way it was working out. I didn't want that much bulk at the ankle. So I ripped it out and I tried again. And I feel like this time I did a much cleaner um, knit together. Because what you're doing is you're pick, you're picking up on the cast on edge and you're knitting it together with your next row of knitting. So I feel like, I did a good job. It's quite stretchy. And I'm gonna have to wear these a little bit to see how I like this folded over cuff. I like the aesthetic and it's kind of fun to have a little pop of color. It's kind of hard to tell, but this is a yellow and my toes and cuffs are green. Toes and heels are green. Um, but I'm gonna have to wear them to see how I like this folded over cuff and if I like how it sits on my ankle. The ribbing, I do like ribbing on the top of a sock because it kind of pulls into your foot a little bit, whereas this one doesn't. You can see it's sort of more of a firm, firm edge, whereas my ribbing from my previous sock pulls in from the main fabric of the sock. So I think that'll be just a case of trying it and seeing if I like it. Did I like knitting it? It wasn't terrible. Once I figured out how to do it nicely and get that really nice edge, then I felt a lot better about it. Um, will I do it again? I don't know. I guess we're gonna have to wait and see. My next basic sock from this book is going to be the one with the flegal heel. Um, I have knit flegal heels before. Um, the one that I'm most familiar with is the one from Andrea Mowry's DRK Everyday Socks, but that's done on a ribbed sock. And I want to see how Summer's technique um, differs from Andrea's, just in how she does the flegal heel, but also, <clears throat> sorry, knitting a flegal heel on a stockinette sock. So I'm looking forward to trying that as my next pair of socks from that book when I'm ready to cast those on. I have um, a few more things off my needles this week. Um, this is sort of a finished and work in progress, but first I'll show you what I'm holding my knitting in. This is a basket that my daughter made. Oh, something's poking out. I got a needle poking out. Um, it's a crocheted blanket or a crocheted basket. I asked her to make it for me. I could, it was a commissioned work. Um, and I will put the name of this pattern in the show notes below. It is crocheted with some um, woolies thick and quick and it is done with that yarn held a double, so it's very thick. And she did this waistcoat stitch, which it turns out she does not like doing. So she made this basket super, super quickly. Like I think she did it in a couple hours. It was very fast, um, but it's just the perfect sort of vessel for this. And I think I'm going to be keeping my socks from the sock project in this basket when I'm done with a project that's currently in it which makes me think I'd like to get her to crochet me another basket. I just need to find one that doesn't have this waistcoat stitch because she did not like it and I heard about it for a couple days after. 
<laughs> anyway, now I am working on some mittens. A couple episodes ago, I made some hats uh, as a part of my contribution for Craft for Yeg, which is um, an organization in Edmonton, which harnesses the power of makers and um, collects donations of handmade things. Uh, and you can donate just about anything. They collect for um, like warm weather attire accessories for everyone from preemies to adults. Um, so any size is always wanted. In fact, school age kids mittens and hats is often what is what is um, sought after. Also, they collect things for pets in shelters. So they collect little rug mats or um, curtains for their crates and snuffle mats. They collect uh, household items for uh, women in need. Uh, it tends to be women who have been displaced due to often domestic abuse and are trying to set themselves up again. And so household items like uh, dishcloths and face cloths and items for the home are often um, requested. I know just recently uh, the Ronald McDonald House, locally here, put out a request for quilts. So there's all sorts of handmade items that are always requested. Um, another popular one is little stuffies, often for kids either um, in care or uh, at a hospital in a waiting room. Um, different organizations will request little things that they can give to their small clientele to make them feel more comfortable. So um, a couple of episodes ago, I had made some hats. I think I made three hats and now I'm making some mittens. And as ever, I am using my super mitten pattern. It's not my pattern. It's just my favorite mitten pattern. Um, I wear these mittens. I made a pair for myself. I wear them all the time. Um, I make them for donating because I can whip up a pair of, of mittens in a few hours. It's just super quick. They're knit again with um, Lion Brand. Lion Brand? Pretty sure it's Lion Brand. Woolies. Do I have a tag in here? Yes, I do. Here it is. Woolies, thick and quick. This is 80% acrylic and 20% wool. And the reason I love it is because it is machine washable, machine dryable. So I don't know who's getting these mittens and they don't know where these where they've gotten these mittens either, especially if it's a kid in a school who's cold um, and just getting a pair of mittens, they're not gonna care about wash instructions. So something that is washable and dryable <clears throat> is going to be for the best. I am making the, um, I think it's a large child yeah. size, but it, there's a dog walking yeah. by, I apologize. Um, it's the size I make for myself. This is, uh, here's a pair that I made. It's the 22 stitch size and um, Again, see, it's the size I make for myself. I don't have very big hands. So these would be great for kids, uh, elementary kids and getting into upper elementary. And this colorway that I've used here is the Hudson Bay color. So it's meant to look like a Hudson Bay blanket. If you know, you know. Um, so here's one pair that I made. Uh, and then I had a little bit of yarn left over from this basket that um, my daughter made me. And I had not quite enough of the Hudson Bay to make a pair of, of mittens. So I, whoops, so I combined them to make another pair of mittens, this time with just a white cuff, which I still think are super cute. Um, so there's another pair. And then I started another pair yesterday. I'm telling you, they're addictive. They go so fast. I knit them on 6.5 millimeter needles, which 10 and a half, I think. I'm using these ones. If that helps you out at all. Um, they're great. So then uh, I had a ball of this Astro Land. So I made one mitten and I'm currently working on the second mitten. Uh, it is just on my needles now and I'm almost to the point where I start with the thumb gusset. So it's super quick project. Um, again, I will probably have I'll definitely have enough for this pair and then I won't have enough quite for another full pair. So either I will make a, the next smallest size, which is probably okay. It would be more of like a small, like a toddler to a small child kind of size. And I think that would be fine. So I might just use whatever yarn I have left after this to make another pair of 
like kid size mittens. And then that will be four pairs of mittens for donation. The collection date for this cycle, because I checked, is going to be, I believe, next Saturday. So March 16th. And the great thing about this amazing organization, it is, I'm, it, they're so wonderful. And uh, they collect thousands and thousands and thousands of projects every year for very deserving and amazing organizations in this community. But on the day before the big collection, so they'll have a day where on a Saturday, they get together at, um, often it's a senior center, but um, it could be anywhere. And they just collect all of the things and sort them and get them ready to be going to the appropriate organizations. But if you can't make it to that day, they have people who will come to your house and collect your donations. So I will be getting in touch with them because unfortunately I can't make it to the donation day, but I will be making sure that all of the things that I have may get to them in good time. So that is my mitten project for right now. And isn't this, see, isn't this basket just, just the best? I've got all my mittens there. I've got my big ball of yarn. Um, everything fits in this one little basket and then I can pick it up by the handles. This and go around and this is why I think I need another one. So it could be that, could be that I'm uh, commissioning another work by my daughter. And I have one more project off the needles and that is my Eva cardigan. I am wearing it. This is what it looks like. You guys, I'm so happy with it. I just tried it on for the first time this morning because I was sewing on buttons up until the time when I came to visit with you. So let me tell you uh, some of the fabulous things that I love about this sweater. When I first had the idea to knit myself a beige sweater, I picked up this yarn at Knit City last year and I picked it up from San Juan Woolworks. The yarn is called Spy Hop and it's a cross of a couple different breeds. It's really actually delightful yarn. I'm quite happy with it. But I just wanted a plain beige cardigan. I just thought that would be something that would be super easy to wear, easy um, to layer. And I just was looking for a plain cardigan pattern. So I found the Eva and I thought I like tin or petite knit patterns. I like her aesthetic, we'll go with that. Um, but when I started to knit it, I was a little concerned that it was gonna be a boring knit, mostly because I, thought that the pattern was a very simple top down. Uh, I kind of was assuming it was raglan. I don't know why. I think the pictures for me were a little bit misleading because the sample knit is um, done in a black yarn and it's a great looking cardigan, but it is a little bit misleading because this sweater has got some really great design features going on. So let me just show you the back shoulder detail right here. Can you see that? This sweater is cast on right across the back from this shoulder to this shoulder. And it's worked down with increases right here and right here. I feel weird with my back to you, so I'm gonna turn down. So there's increases right here along those two backs. And then you knit down for little ways, maybe even about here. And then you pick up stitches along the rows you've been knitting. And then you start, no, that's a lie. You knit down for a little ways and then you put that yarn on hold and then you pick up here and in this direction for a while. And then you pick up the stitches along these rows that you've done and down here, and then you work back and forth and it creates this really beautiful set in sleeve. And let me just see if I can show you that a little bit better, but how, lovely that sleeve is set in there. It was a delight. I started knitting this sweater on a Friday afternoon. I think it was actually after I had recorded a podcast. Spoiler alert, I record on Friday and I post on Sunday. It's just how I do it. Um, and I knit probably to about here. So I had, I just could not stop knitting. I thought it was so interesting the way that it was created. Um, you do these increases here to create the V. And um, there's a lot of things I just love about how 
this sweater is made. It's got a really deep armhole, which for a cardigan is so nice. When you throw it on, you don't want to be um, feeling like you, you're sort of constricted here in the arm, upper arm, especially when you've got a t-shirt on. You don't want to feel like things are bunched up. The sleeve is quite full, and then you've got this nice ribbing at the end. It's a great length for me, and everybody knows, if you've watched this podcast, I have short arms. So this sweater just fits me so nicely. Um, I did a whole bunch of ribbing at the bottom, as uh, recommended. The one thing, the one thing that I did differently for this pattern was um, I did a tubular sewn bind off. So let me just take the sweater off so that I can show you the bottom hem because that's where it started. Actually, no, it started on the cuff of the sleeve. So I'll show you that. Um, now my favorite bind off is a tubular sewn bind off. It just creates such a clean edge. It looks like your knitting just sort of travels over. I'll show you, I'll show you this side. It looks like your knitting just continues to roll over into the other side, into the back side of your knitting. It creates a very clean edge. It's quite stretchy. Whoops. It's quite stretchy. And I just really like the look of it. But um, a tubular sewn bind off is done on, historically done, on knit one, purl one. So for this sweater, I did a little jiggery pokery, um, which just means I moved some stitches around to make that happen. And I did a little video of how this process looked when I was doing the sewn bind off for this button band. And I'll show you that video right now. I've worked 14 rows of the ribbing for the placket and I'm ready to get ready for my tubular bind off. I like to do a sewn tubular bind off because I feel like it gives a nice stretchy rounded edge. And here's what it looks like on my bottom hem. Um, it will stretch out, it's, it's got a lot of give to it and I think that it makes a nice edging, but really it needs to be done on one by one ribbing. So I need to prepare my two by two ribbing so that I can eventually do my sewn tubular bind off here too. Um, to do that, I'm going to have to move some stitches around. So I'm going to start my row by slipping the first stitch with yarn in front purl wise, uh, as I have been doing the whole time. Then I'm going to knit one, or sorry, purl one. Now I'm ready to start moving my stitches around. So I'm going to just basically reverse the position of this knit and this purl stitch. It's like doing a little cable and I like to do that without a needle. So I'm just going to slip this knit stitch on my front needle and slip the purl stitch onto my back needle. I put the knit stitch back on the left needle and now I'm just going to knit one and purl one. My next two stitches are right where I want them. So I've got a knit and then a purl. Sorry for my dog. And now we're going to have to switch these two stitches again. So I'm going to place my right needle into the knit stitch on the front side. I'm going to pull my, le my left needle out and pop that purl stitch onto it again in the back right here. And now I'm going to place the knit stitch back on the left and knit, work them as they appear. So the first one is a knit and then a purl. And now I have a knit and then a purl. So you're only having to do this half of the time. The other half of the time, the stitches will be right where you want them to be. So I'm going to move my stitches. I'm going to take that knit stitch and swap it with the purl stitch. Knit and purl and then knit and purl. I'm going to do this across the whole row. Uh, I'm doing this on the wrong side row. It could equally be done on the right side row. Um, it doesn't really matter because once we do the bind off, it won't be visible or it won't be super obvious. I am going to work this whole row 
doing these switches and then working the stitches so that by the time I get to the end, all of my stitches will be knit one, purl one, knit one, purl one. And I'll meet you when I'm getting ready to work my next row. I finished row 15. That was the row where I was having all of the stitches <laughs> switch places. So then I, now I'm in a position to have knit one, purl one across the row. Um, the end of the rows were three knits. And so what I'm going to do on row 16 to get ready to do my tubular bind off is knit one and then slip one with the yarn in front. These first three stitches I'm going to um, work as if the middle stitch was a purl. So I'm going to take, sorry about that, take the first stitch, I'm going to slip it as the pattern recommends that keeps my nice edge and then I'm going to slip the next one with the yarn in front and then I'm going to knit a stitch and then I'm going to slip all of the purls with my yarn in front and I will knit all of the knits and I'm going to do that right across the row. This is going to prepare my stitches for that sewn tubular bind off. I'm going to slip and knit and slip and knit and I'm going to do that all the way across this row. This is row 16. It's a right side row and I'm going to do work the whole row in that way. So I completed row 16. That was a right side row and now I'm on to a wrong side row, row 17. And I'm going to do the same thing as I did on the last row. I'm going to slip the first stitch and I'm going to slip all of the purl stitches with my yarn in front and knit all the knit stitches. So when we were on the other side, we were slipping these knit stitches because they appeared as purl stitches. And now that we're on the wrong side, we're gonna be slipping all of those stitches that we knit on the previous row and slipping all of the knits. So if that made sense, we're basically doing the exact same thing. So now my next stitch is a purl. I'm going to slip it with my yarn in front. And then I'm going to knit the knits and slip the purls with yarn in front. Slip, knit, slip, knit all the way to the end of this row. And at the end of this row, which is row 17, we will be ready to do our sewn Italian bind off. All right, I have finished my last row where I was slipping and knitting, and now I'm ready to do my sewn bind off. When I do this bind off, and I do it frequently, I always give myself a really, really, really long tail. My tail is always far longer than I need it to be but uh, I would rather have extra yarn than run out. So I have an extremely long tail of yarn and it is on a blunt tapestry needle like this. And I'm gonna start the sewn bind off. This sewn bind off works um, on, as I said, knit one, purl one. So the first stitch we are going to go through the stitch purl wise or as if to purl. And leave it on the needle. Then we're going through the next stitch knit wise. This is very similar to doing a Kitchener bind off where you divided up all of your knits and your purls on separate needles, but I prefer this one because I don't like the hassle of trying to juggle two needles and perform a Kitchener or a sewn bind off. So I am going to be, or grafting if you prefer. So I, I, I prefer to do it this way with all of my stitches on one needle. So I went through the first stitch purl wise, then the next stitch knit wise. Now I'm going to go through that first stitch again, but knit wise. We'll pull my ridiculously long tail of yarn through and then I will slide that stitch off. I try to keep my bind off pretty loose um, because I want it to have stretch. 
Now I'm going through, I have bound off that first stitch, it is no longer on the needle. Now I'm going through the second stitch on my left hand needle and I'm going through it purl wise. Again, with my really long tail, pull it through. And then I'm gonna go through the first stitch purl wise and I'm gonna slip it off. Slip it off. For this first few stitches, I do like to stop and just sort of sort myself out, make sure everything is looking pretty and neat um, as I get started and that I'm not pulling anything too tight. Okay, so I have bound off two stitches. Now I'm going to take my second stitch on my left hand needle, which is a purl, and I wanna go through it knit wise, but I have to go through it from behind. So I'm gonna take my needle from behind, poke it kind of through the stitches there, and then go through that stitch knit wise. That is the most awkward part of this bind off. <laughs> now I'm going to pull my ridiculously long tail through. In fact, if you wanted to call this the ridiculously long tail sewn cast off, that would be okay with me. Okay, now I'm going to go through the first stitch, which is a knit stitch from this side. I'm going to go through it knit wise and I'm going to pull it off the needle. And just work my end so that it's looking pretty. And after the first few stitches, you start to see it come together as a knit stitch, a purl stitch, a knit stitch. Now we're gonna go through the second stitch on the left needle, which is a knit. We're going to go through it purl wise and we can do this from the front so that's not too awkward honestly okay and then we'll go through the first stitch purl wise and slip it off Then we'll go through the second stitch knit wise. This is a purl, so we have to go through from the back through that stitch. I'll show you that again. I come up through the back of the work and then through that stitch knit wise. And then we'll do the first stitch, which is a knit. We will go through it knit wise and it will come off. So I'm just going to keep repeating those same steps until I've worked all of the stitches on my needle. It's going to take some time because I have quite a few stitches on this needle um, because I'm doing the neck band of a sweater. But you can see it gives a really nice edge um, and it's quite stretchy. So the idea is to keep it relatively loose and I like to just tidy it up every once in a while watching what I'm doing. So this bind off does take longer than let's say just a normal cast off, but I find that I really am happy with the results when I take the time to do it. So I'm going to go through this knit stitch. We'll go through it purl wise. And then the first stitch is a purl stitch. I'm going to purl it and, or go through it purl wise and it will come off. Sorry about that. The next stitch, the next second stitch on the needle is a purl. So I'm going to go through that knit wise from the back. Pulling my long tail through. And 
and then the first stitch is a knit and I'm going to go through it knitwise and it will come off. And that is what my bind off is going to look like. I'm going to keep going until I've completed the whole thing. I'm really, really happy with how my bind offs turned out. Starting off with the cuffs, that was the first thing I, I bound off because I knit the sleeves before finishing the body. Then I went to the bottom of the bottom hem of the body and I did it there too. Again, it's stretchy, but it does have a little bit of um, substance to it. So it doesn't feel like it's um, just gonna fall apart or anything. And then because I had been so successful with using that bind off in other areas, I did it also on the button band. And the button band is by far the biggest bind off because it's just the longest bit of ribbing that you're doing. And again here, I think that it was quite successful. Again, I had to move the stitches at the very end, uh, but if, if you don't pull it, it doesn't, you, it's kind of hard to tell that stitches are really being moved. And then it does create a stretchy bind off, but it, it doesn't feel like the button band is um, so, hmm, so where, what's the word for it? The bind off keeps the um, ribbing sort of in place without allowing it to stretch out too much. So it gives it a little bit of structure without giving it too much structure. Does that make sense? So that was one of the things that I changed with the original pattern. When I was getting ready to knit the button band, which is the last thing you do on a cardigan like this, um, and it sort of has to be done at the end because you need to be able to finish the whole body because you start picking up stitches at the very bottom hem and go around. Now, as I was reading the instructions for the button band, I was a little bit confused. I don't know if confused is the word. I just, I was having a hard time understanding the instructions for the buttonholes. And I have knit a number of different buttonholes. Let me just show you what one of those buttonholes looks like right here from the right side. You can see it's tucked in in that little pearl divot. And the nice thing about this button band or this buttonhole is that it's it does have a little bit of structure on each side. Sometimes the buttonholes can have a bit of a loose uh, edge on the two sides of it, depending on what buttonhole you're using. This one was a different one, one that I had never seen before. So I thought I will give it a try. I want to see how this works. But I didn't fully understand the instructions. So I did a little research. I found a video of a lovely crafter who had um, sort of done uh, an explanation on how these buttonholes are worked. And so um, I did them in the way that was, uh, having seen it once, it made a lot more sense to me. I just sort of needed, I guess, a different way of hearing it for it to make sense for me. So um, I went ahead and I used those buttonholes as described in the pattern and I'm quite happy with them. So I have done a little description of how those buttonholes are worked and I'm going to insert that here now just in case you might be knitting the Eva cardigan and you might be a little confused about how these buttonholes are worked or maybe you're looking for a great new buttonhole to try for a cardigan you're working on. Here's a little video I did showing you how I worked these buttonholes. I'm working the button band for my Eva cardigan and the buttonholes for this pattern are slightly different than any other buttonholes I've worked. So I thought I would show you how I do them. I marked each spot for my buttonhole with a light bulb marker. So I've worked up to one right now and I'm gonna take this marker out because I don't need it anymore. Now the instructions say to slip um, the first purl stitch knitwise, and then slip the next purl stitch knitwise, and pass the first one over. It's all pretty normal. Now I'm going to slip that purl stitch back to the right needle, and the next instruction is to cast three stitches on using a double backward loop technique. So double backward loop. Uh, is very similar to the backward loop so I'm just going to make a loop with my yarn and then I'm going to add an extra twist and that is the double loop. Oops. Let's try that again. Twist once, twist it again, slide it on my needle. 
That's one. Make one twist, another twist, and place it on my needle. One more stitch. And there we go. There are my three stitches. The next instructions are to knit two together and to knit one. Now I'm going to work to the next buttonhole and do the same thing. I've come to the next um, buttonhole, so I'll just show you that one more time. I'll remove the butt or the stitch marker and I will slip the two purl stitches knitwise and then pass the first one over top of the second one. The purl stitch goes back on the left hand needle and I'm going to cast on three stitches with that double loop technique. So I will twist it once, I will twist it again, and then place it on the needle. So that's one, two, and three. And then I'll knit two together and knit one. I'll work the best of the buttonholes and then to the end of this row, and I'll come back and show you how to work the wrong side of this buttonhole, which completes the technique. I've been working the next row, which is a wrong side row, and I've come to a buttonhole. The previous two stitches I worked were two purls in my knit two purl two ribbing. So I'm going to knit the first two stitches of my buttonhole as they appear. I'm going to try to knit the first two. There we go. One and two. I'm going to slip the next two stitches knitwise. And then I'm going to place them back on my left hand needle. Oops. Trying not to split the stitches. Okay. Now I'm going to purl those two stitches that I just slipped through the back loop. So I come through those two stitches from the wrong, from the wrong side here through both stitches and purl it. And then I'll purl one stitch. And that is um, the completed buttonhole. When you work those knit two together on the right side and the purl two together on the left side, it stabilizes the edge of that buttonhole so it's not going to stretch out. I'm gonna to knit to the but next buttonhole and I'll show you that one more time. And here's that buttonhole one more time. So I'm going to knit the first two stitches. My yarn is a little bit splitty, so I'm just taking my time to make sure I get all of the strands as I work these stitches. I'm going to knit this next two stitches, or I'm going to slip the next two stitches knitwise. And then they'll go back on the left needle. And now I'm going to purl those two stitches together through the back loop. I'm making sure to get all the strands of those two stitches. Oops. And now I'm going to purl the next stitch. And that's the buttonholes finished. Now I get to finish working the ribbing of the button band. So that means a few more rows of knit two purl two. I hope you found that helpful. Um, I'm really happy with the way this sweater turned out. In fact, I'm just delighted with it and I think I'm gonna be wearing it a ton. The buttonholes um, are snug, but I can fit a rather large uh, button through them without, uh, without any problem, as you can see. Um, 
I'm a big fan and I think I'm going to be wearing it a ton. So if you're looking for a really great basic cardigan, the Eva Cardigan by Petite Knits, I would absolutely recommend it. I could see myself knitting another one of these actually um, at some point in the future. I have a couple of things I've been working on in the last couple of weeks. I know there's been a lot of projects that I've finished, but I do have a couple of other little oddball things. And one of them is cross stitch. Now uh, I have started this, pro the cross stitch project maybe to go with my sock project. I'm not sure. Um, Diana Waters, you've heard me talk about her before. She's done a series of um, cross stitch pictures which um, create a mystery. You can see the first one right here in my bookcase, <laughs> along with a little portrait of the person who designed it. So this, the way that this mystery Chris cross stitch works is it's a, a bunch of five 20 something roommates. They've moved in together and each one decorated a room in their house. And each room that you cross stitch has a hint or a clue for the mystery. It is apparently a murder mystery. And so um, this was, Room number one, it's called Luna's living room. And this is a little portrait of Luna. And now I'm working on Davy's den. So this is the den now of the house. And so I've completed one portion of that cross stitch picture. I'll just show you right now. As ever with my cross stitch, this is not perfect. Uh, I definitely made mistakes in terms of what colors needed to be used where. Um, Oh, I see. I missed a little spot right there. I'm going to have to catch up before I move on to the other side. Um, but it's been a lot of fun working on. It's nice using a different sort of part of your brain when you use a different craft. Um, and cross stitch is something that's been sort of in my life for a long time. When I was a kid, I remember my uh, mom doing petty point and cross stitch. And also my grandmother often was doing cross stitch or petty point in the winter months when she couldn't be outside gardening. And uh, so it's, it's sort of nice to carry on that tradition in sort of a weird and wacky way. Um, so this is room two of the mystery house. Uh, and I have thoughts about what the clue on this one is, but I'll wait to tell you until I'm finished. Um, again, lots of fun. The only thing that's been a little bit trickier for me is this darker canvas it makes it harder to see the holes. But I find if, I, if I'm cross-stitching and I have like a light source or even a white piece of paper behind it, it makes it easier for me to see where the holes are. And um, I know that a function of that is my aging eyeballs, but also it is, it is a little bit harder to see on this dark um, fabric. But it's been going along nicely, um, fun. It makes a nice change of pace from my knitting. So that's Davy's Den. And that's room number two in this mystery. Um, cross stitch project by Diana Waters. The last thing I have on my needles is a pair of socks. I cast these on, ooh, I think Wednesday night when I was going to knit night with um, some friends. And uh, this, this is my March sock. I've been knitting through a stash of sport weight um, self-striping yarn that I've gotten from Knit Spin Farm. I took part in their um, yarn club last year. So this is the Sand Hill Crane colorway was their March colorway from last year. And I cast on and I worked um, a few rounds. I'm gonna work just a little bit more before I start putting in the heel. This is the heel color. And so I'm gonna wait until I'm sort of halfway through the next red stripe before I put the heel in. And I think for this pair of socks, I'm going to do a heel flap and gusset, um, because why not? So that is my March um, sport weight socks. This is a Targi sport weight yarn. Um, it's beautiful. If you're looking for some sport weight yarn, uh, the Targi sport weight yarn from Knit Spin Farm is amazing. It, I was wearing some socks just the other day that I had finished. Um, they're really soft and lovely and cozy and I can't recommend them enough. So really the only knitting I have on my needles is this pair of socks. So you will see me um, soon sometime soon, casting on a new sweater. My plan uh, for the last few months has been to start knitting some more summer knits starting in March. Um, it's perfect timing. And the pattern that I'm gonna start with is the Sabella Pullover by Isabel Kramer. 
Here's what, a picture of what this sweater looks like. I'm going to be knitting mine in one color and I'm going to be using this Knitting for Olive silk. It's 100% burette silk. I'm not sure what the burette means. I'm going to have to look that up for next time. But this is Knitting for Olive and I bought this locally uh, at a shop called Statement Junkie. It's in Sherwood Park, which is a community that is right next to Edmonton. It's it's super convenient for me to get there. And I love that they carry different yarns than other stores in, in the Edmonton area. We're, we're really kind of lucky in the sense that there are a number of different yarn stores and they all carry different lines of yarn. So Statement Junkie carries Knitting for Olive and I've never knit with their silk, so it's been on my bucket list. Uh, I have five skeins of this lovely, it's called Ice Blue. And uh, I plan on just knitting like a summertime pullover. I'm gonna make it long sleeve because uh, where I live in the evenings or on rainy days, it's still cool. And it's nice to have a longer sleeve, plain, kind of long sleeve t-shirt, I guess, is what I'm sort of going for. And I think the Sabella pullover by Isabel Kramer will fit the bill nicely. So that will be going on my needles in the next couple of weeks. I hope that you have time in the next couple of weeks to do the things you like to do, whether that is um, shopping for yarn, trying out some new patterns from a book that you just got, or admiring a newly finished project. I know I plan on knitting a lot. Thanks so much for joining me and I'll see you soon. Bye.